Welcome to Align to Your Design. I'm your host, Beth Davis. Isn't it time to wrap your business around your purpose and bring your greatest work to the world? Each week, join me as we explore various biometric tools, such as human design and hand analysis, and how to use them to fulfill your destiny and align to your design. We will reveal how to do the work you are designed to do, rather than what you think you should do. Hey everyone, Beth Davis here. Welcome to Align to Your Design, where I invite people on the show who I feel are currently living their design. They are in their purpose, they are on purpose, and they're being of service to others by bringing their greatest work out into the world. Now today, we have a very exciting conversation for you that I think you're going to really get a lot out of. I'm going to be talking with a talent manager and artist in his own right about what goes into mentoring and advising creative people. Now, if you've been in the Your Purpose community for a while, you know that we attract very creative people. I call you all the healing artist, ambitious entrepreneurs, because you're this interesting blend of being very right brain, risk-taking, uh, very innovative in your creativity, and also interested in the structure and systems that goes into building a successful business so you have consistent income, consistent revenue, and uh, creating that kind of balance in your life. And I think that makes for a very balanced life. So that's what we're going to explore today. Our guest is named Joel Zadak, and he is an Emmy award-winning producer and manager. He grew up in Chicago, and he always enjoyed comedy and appreciating movies as we all did, such as Animal House and anything by Cheech and Chong. His dad introduced him and his twin brother to R-rated comedies on cable far earlier than the average parent would allow. So did my father, thank you, dad. And that made him feel special, I agree. After college, Joel frequented the Second City Comedy Theater World, and many of you have heard of Second City out of Chicago, and that's where some of the greats came from, like Gilda Radner, John Belushi, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, and Steve Carell, uh, got their feet wet and performed and really developed their craft before they became the big stars you know today. That inspired Joel to take creative writing and screenwriting classes at Second City. He wanted to write the next big comedy hit as many creative people do. Uh, he then moved out to LA where he got into a grad program for screenwriting at UCLA, but then he dropped out once he landed a job assisting a manager in the entertainment industry and realized that Hollywood was a full-time job in of itself. Shortly after, his boss left to start his own company and Joel was promoted to manager in just four months. That is very impressive. And that's when his next level comedy adventures began. And let's fast forward to today. Here is Joel's philosophy on the people he likes to represent and work with as a talent manager. He says, it's pretty much a prerequisite for me that they have interests and talents in multiple fields. That means they are writer slash performers, writer slash directors, directors slash performers, stand-up comedian slash actor. I really think it's imperative that they are content generators. They're not just what I call vendors, vending their acting services or writing services. I want them to direct or perform because I really love multiple points of entry. I love those artists who can not only be the visionary, but also the implementer. Mm, isn't that a familiar thing I'm saying to all of you all the time? The person who comes up with the idea and then also executes the idea. Ideas are cheap. Execution is expensive. And if you can do both, then you have a long future in this or any business, unquote. Two of Joel's superpowers are networking and listening. I can attest to that. Joel currently resides with his wife and two children in Southern California. Let's we welcome our amazing guest today, Joel Zadak to Align to Your Design. Welcome, Joel. How are Hi. you? Great I'm to so see you. Ha I'm happy to have you here today. This is awesome. I, my first question to you is about you. Yeah. When it comes to your own creativity, where, where do you personally find the most satisfaction? Is it writing, acting, directing? Where is it for you? 
It's definitely in the writing. I, you know, I moved to LA years ago to be a writer. Even when I was in Chicago studying improvisation, it was really to improve my writing skills. I, I love to write, you know, I'm, I write every day, it, be it a journal or a novel that I'm working on, or I was previously writing a, a self-help book that I had to put down at the beginning of the pandemic because a lot of the advice I was giving might not be relevant post-pandemic. So yeah, writing is definitely what I enjoy doing the most. And what is your writing process? Oh, when you say you write every day, do you, do you write at a certain time of day? Yeah, do I write in the morning. Conditions in the morning. I write in the morning. I will, you know, wake up, meditate, maybe do some stretching exercises, and then I'll really get to writing. And I'll usually set aside a specific time. And it all depends on what I'm writing, how much time I give, but I will put it on a timer and then I'll start. And then as soon as the timer is done, I'll finish the sentence I'm writing and then that's it. So how do you know when the writing is done, quote unquote done and ready to go to the next stage to it, to an edit or to, to being delivered? Well, I, I'll just write as much as I can about something and then I'll finish and then I'll go back and edit it when, you know, if, if your question is, when is it ready for somebody else to read or mm -hmm. to send out? That's a great question. I just usually kind of read it. I feel it in my bones. Do I think it's the best point? You know, is it uh, Beth, you and I were in a, a program called Strategic Coach and they talk about this you know, 80, 20 rule where you want to get something, you know, the idea of it is creating something, getting it to 80% of its, of its potential and then passing it on. So I, I like that principle. I would say if I think it's 80% there, I will then send it off because I know that there's going to be more, no matter where I send it, it's never going to be completely finished. Yeah. And the beauty of that 80, 20 rule when it comes to projects is it, it takes out that perfectionism and the need for it to be just so. It's like, like Dan Kennedy, another Dan said, good is good enough and, yeah. and, and get it moving. Great. And what do you typically write about? Well, I, you know, the, the, the self-help book I was writing about was really a book um, uh, with geared to an audience of people who wanted to make comedy their profession, you know, come to Hollywood and be a professional comedian, writer, director, actor, whatever. That was the, that was the book. Um, that I was writing. The novel that I'm writing is really, um, it's about, um, it's really about surrender. And it's, a, it's based on characters of people that I know, and their fictitious journey to healing and better than, bettering themselves to surrendering to what life is for them. What does surrender mean to you? Surrender to me, and it's something that I'm, I'm actually working on so a lot in my in my personal work is a couple of things. One, it's letting go of the need to control your life. And it's also just truly loving and appre appreciation, loving and appreciating the truth and what is. Do you have any particular spiritual practice? You mentioned meditating in the morning. Can, yeah, can you I mean, share I, more about that? Well, I'll, I'll met, I meditate and I've been lately, I, you know, I switch up what particular method I'm using right now. I'm using a method called the Jose Silva method um, and I will meditate. And in that meditation, I, um, I've created what I call my circle of elders in one of my favorite spots in Yosemite. And the circle of elders consi consist of people real or fictitious in my life who are older and wiser than me. And in that meditation, I will speak directly to them and ask them questions. And then they give me advice. That's one of the things I do. I also am very much into breath work, both um, uh, the Wim Hof method, which is mm -hmm. very popular on, online. Wim Hof is a fascinating human being and he's got a great method that's very simple. And then I also um, regularly practice and I have, I'm a trained facilitator in a method called revelation breath work which is a variation on holotropic breath work, which is intended to get you to some of those abnormal states, those non-typical states that will maybe bring some wisdom, some advice, help you see things that you may not be able to see in the, in the conscious mind. Wonderful, thank you. So in terms of the people you represent as a, as a talent manager, in, yeah. in addition to being a spiritual seeker and artist yourself, yeah. What, what do you, you, you mentioned that you look for people who, who have multiple skills Correct. and can enter into creativity in multiple different ways. 
Is there a is there a set of criteria that you mentally go through or kind of checklist when you're bringing on a new client where you think, oh, this person's ideal for what I do? Absolutely. I mean, number one, I think I have to find them talented and think that, you know, they're really good and that I feel that I can sell them. Um, and then, you know, I meet with them and, and I get a sense of their mindset. Are there people, are they people who want a relationship with me and want to kind of grow creatively together? Or are they somebody who, uh, which I much appreciate and, and, and definitely favor, or are they somebody who is just going to ask me to do stuff for them and then rely on me to make their career go? Those are the people that I kind of tend to shy away from. So it really is. And then, you know, obviously talent and, you know, mindset is, you know, like I said, is another one. And do they, I asked the question, do they have something to say that I believe um, is original and that is worthy of being spread to the masses? And I think that people will respond to and want more of. What do you think are some of the things that need to be said more by artists that maybe aren't being said out in the marketplace of entertainment? I don't know if I have specific examples of what needs to be said more, but as it relates to even, you know, the work that you do, I think people need to speak, you know, from their truth, from their authenticity, from their, their, their life purpose, and be very excited to express that. I think it's, you know, everyone who's in this business will talk about how authenticity sells and many of their favorite projects are have an element of authenticity yet mm -hmm. so much of hollywood and the world and social media is uh, people projecting themselves of how they want to be seen or mm -hmm. how they think will be uh, well received and you know a lot of you know hollywood has long had a um a criticism of uh, of it being phony of the people within it being phony and superficial and the reason that it has that reputation is because it's oftentimes true. Um, but I think what needs to be more said is, is really um, people's truth and what works for them. And, you know, hopefully they can continue to, you know, grow whatever that is to the, the point where it is truly special, to truly special and, and, and worthy of being digested and purchased. So what are some of the, the biggest stumbling blocks your clients bump into? Do you have any examples of things they bump up against that potentially could create a creativity block or even create some setbacks in their career? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly what is a stumbling block for so many of the artists that I work with is a need to make a certain income, to make a living. And that oftentimes means taking jobs, you know, being hired as a writer, being hired as a director, an actor, what have you, in a project that doesn't fully align with their purpose or what their original ideas will be. There's, there's that, there's this like need to make money. Uh -huh. There's this also this need to gain experience. You know, the ideal artist, you know, for me, I represent uh, uh, a tremendous artist named Jordan Peele, who, you know, was a, an actor on Mad TV and created Key and Peele and then, you know, wrote and directed Get Out and Us and many other projects. And, you know, he is fortunately at a place where he can choose his next projects. Mm -hmm. He is in the, you know, extreme minority of artists in Hollywood who can truly choose their next projects. So what the stumbling block is for, for so many of my clients is how do they get to the point where they are fully trusted in their creativity by the people who hold the purse strings and the, the something like what they need to do in order to get there. And oftentimes it does mean taking jobs or working on projects that aren't fully aligned with their purpose and authenticity. So they, do we call that paying your dues? It's certainly paying the dues, but it's also, you know, it's also, there's the paying the dues that go to um, learning your craft. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the, the kind of the paying the dues of like, how do you get to a point where you are considered valuable and can attract an audience. And many, many artists have attracted an audience by doing things and doing projects and work that were not fully aligned with their purpose and their authenticity. And that's just the way that the art world oftentimes works.
So what would you say to someone, say, starting out in the comedy field in terms of what they could do to increase their chances of getting that audience and potentially getting investors to want to invest in their work? Well, the first thing I always recommend to anybody, you know, getting into into entertainment is to create content where that is authentic, that is aligned with their purpose and their and their voice, you know, whether it's comedy or drama or horror or what have you, is be able to create something. And, you know, one of the stumbling blocks to that is, you know, what is that thing that's going to get people's attention? Number one, what is the idea? And number two, how am I going to pay for this? And number three, who am I going to enlist to help me make it real? Because oftentimes anything that's considered content, especially entertainment, requires more than one person to do. Um, so it's it's really about figuring out what that is and figuring out your system. You know, I've I'm long been a proponent of people getting involved in bona fide education systems for, for you know, when it comes to comedy, the theaters, the comedy theaters, you know, Upright Citizens, Citizens Brigade, you know, the Groundlings, Second City, the various places, because not only does that provide you an education, but it introduces you to a bunch of other people who could be your present and future collaborators. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so much of entertainment is, it's a, it's a system of collaboration. And the sooner that one can find their cadre of collaborators and then also learn the skill set of collaboration which we all know is not not easy the better they'll be suited to you know springboard their success once they get their opportunities that's great and what do you personally find funny that's the first question and the second question is what do you think people ought to joke about more that maybe they don't I mean, I personally, I like a lot of comedy. I, I some tend to gravitate towards silly. Um, either silly comedy or comedy that speaks about individuals' insecurities and then relationship insecurities. And what I think people should joke more about is themselves and their relationships. And, you know, we're in this very strange times right now and a lot of it's really good where there's we're, we have a strong pc culture we have a time's up culture we have a me too culture we have a black lives matter and stop asian hate culture so there is this you know nervousness to talk about subject matters that are outside of one's demographic mm -hmm. and you know one of the ways that you know i advise combating that or that some of my you know best clients wisest clients advise combating that is to have their material talk about the human condition and talk about their own personal experience in in the world and i think if you can do that you likely can avoid um being canceled or being a victim of the cancel culture if you take ownership of it if you take ownership of it and if it is really meant to speak to your insecurities your fallibilities your experience within the world and it's about what if you're talking about things that all human beings face i you're, you're probably pretty safe so what what got you interested in in relationships as a theme from from your own experience like how did how did that come about i know that's a huge question but i mean what what comes to mind in terms of why relationships I mean, I've always, I've never lived alone. You know, I grew up with a twin brother. So I grew up with somebody who's my fraternal twin brother, but there was always somebody who looked just like me going through the exact same thing as me. And yet we were very different. So there was a lot of comparing and contrasting growing up. And, um, you know, I lived with my brother and my, and my parents growing up. And then when I went to college, I always had roommates and they were really, really good people. And we got along really well. And we were, you know, always all it was, you know, four guys. We always had girlfriends and there's my son yelling in the background. Uh, we always had girlfriends and there was always people around. And I was fascinated about who was attracted to whom, why they liked people. I was, we would laugh about what went wrong in relationships. We would laugh about each other's faux pas and false, you know, false moves and, and stupid drunken nights and what we said and what we did. And yet at the end of it, we always really appreciated and liked each other. And that was just fascinating to me. And we, I had a lot of laughs 
in college, post-college and the like. So that's what really, I think, started it for me. So it sounds like that there's a, a fair, you associate relationships, close relationships as something positive. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody wants that, but I don't know that that's everybody's association. What has been challenging for you personally in relationships? What has been challenging for me personally in relationships is I've got so many things and it's all things that I'm working on on my various therapies and shamanic work and breath work and spiritual coach that I work with. And I think, you know, at least now what I've been working with is that, you know, my life was, you know, from the outside somewhat idyllic, you know, it, I, you know, grew up, you know, middle class and in a, in a nice neighborhood. I went to good schools that were public schools that we didn't have to pay for. But I think so much of what I'm, I'm working on is just trusting my feelings. And then when a feeling comes up, actually feeling it, you know, I grew up in a, um, I grew up in a, in a, in a time where, you know, Boys weren't supposed to have feelings. They weren't supposed to cry. They weren't supposed, you know, supposed to emote. If they did, they were referred to as like the derogatory terms for homosexuals. <laughs> and it was like, don't feel. And then I, you know, I also grew up playing competitive sports and it was very much about beat the other people, be better, don't, you know, be stoic, don't show emotion. And um, that got me through my younger years, but has been very challenging in my adult life because uh, I've, I've rationalized why I shouldn't feel certain emotions. And that just doesn't work as, as many people who have grown up and, and gone through the therapies and have lived a more rich, borderline enlightened life have, have realized. And that's what I also enjoy as a manager talking with artists is really um, encouraging them to write about their feelings, to create work about their feelings, to own it, to certainly discuss it openly and not to push it down because that's so much of what has led to, in my opinion, a lot of the, uh, the toxic masculinity that's made the news and caused the, create, you know, the current cancel culture or some of the, you know, political or uh, social unrest in our country. So I'm wondering about something I've observed and I'm, I'm gonna, I, I wanna just apologize in advance. This is a bit of a generalization, but I'm, I'm wondering from your own, so I'm gonna take the generalization and make it a personal question to you. In your own personal experience as a man, ha have you found when you were younger that you would think thoughts positive or negative or have feelings and not express them? just not communicate them to people. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think it's harder for men. I mean, one, women just talk more statistically anyways. We, we talk to release oxytocin and, and what the research shows is that men tend to go internal as a group, uh, yeah. generally speaking, go internal with their feelings. Do you think that is innate and conditioning, more innate or more conditioning? What do you, what do you, what's your experience with that? I mean, it's absolutely, I would lean it more towards conditioning for sure. Um, there is, you know, I've been also studying a lot about, you know, the masculine and the feminine and how they interact because they exist in all human beings, whether they're men or women or non-binary. And so there is a little bit of the, you know, it's a generalization, but I would say that women contain more of the more feminine than masculine and men contain more masculine than feminine. And there are the traits that are associated with both and the, the, the emotional, the sharing, the caring, the nurturing, those are all, you know, feminine attributes. And then the conditioning of, of uh, growing up as a man, as a, in a competitive household, in a competitive world of get good grades, you know, make a lot of money, win sports games, all that, it, the, the, the nurturing, the sharing, I don't know, it was like, it was like more for me, the, the, the more I succeed, the more I will have a chance of, of surviving, not dying, and then also being separate and above the fray. It's kind of brutal. It is brutal. Do you think it's brutal for men until they find their way 
to where you have because it is life brutal for you now that's my first question is it it's it was brutal i will say it was brutal for me until i made a conscious choice to to work on it and was there a turning point when you made that choice like what made you decide Oh, I got to go deeper. I need to get more connected. There was a couple turning points. One of them was the uh, the death of a, of a very close friend of mine who died from a pneumonia unexpectedly. And uh, other ones were, you know, I had all these dreams of being successful, you know, making a certain amount of money, having a certain number of clients who were doing very, very well, you know, maybe winning, you know, an Emmy. All those things came true. And for the first time, and, and then there wasn't the, the happiness and fulfillment that I thought would happen when those came true. And then from that point forward, you know, I had a, you know, a, for the first time in my life, a baseline of depression. And I said to myself, there has to be more than this. What is going on here? And I remember sitting in an airport once waiting for a plane that was delayed. And then I, I struck up a conversation with a woman who told me, that I was uh, that that she was a therapist, and I said I think I might have imposter syndrome. This was this you know on the heels of all mm -hmm. my success, and then feeling I didn't deserve it, or feeling that it was it was false. And um, she said I don't think you have impo imposter syndrome, but you likely have some you know trauma from your youth that has gone you know unhealed or unresolved. And she was an EMDR therapist, and then she recommended I try EMDR. And then I tried EMDR and I uncovered some memories and some root issues of what was likely, you know, causing a lot of this. And that really kicked me into gear to explore more yet. And one of the things I found out in doing talk therapy is that I would leave every session with a headache because I would use my mind and my mind would be hyperactive to rationalize my emotions and I was largely ignoring my body and what my body was telling me because my mind didn't trust my body and my body didn't trust my mind. So I started um, uh, in, uh, investigating um, modalities of therapy work that involved the body. And that's when I really started making a breakthrough in my recent years, got far more in touch with my feminine aspects got you know far more honest with the way I was feeling. I got more expressive, you know, my throat shocker of my truth opened up and I started sharing more. And all of that allowed me, I feel, to better represent my clients who are artists. And one thing that I've come to know about artists, not to make complete generalization, but what I find about artists is that they are, um, we all have trauma as children. I feel that most artists are lean towards the more sensitive side of people. Mm -hmm. So they're, they were more um, sensitive to the trauma that you know, their parents or caretakers or peers laid on them. They worked through a lot of their trauma, either consciously or unconsciously through the creation of art. That, and then if it was good, that gave them a little bit of recognition from some of their peers. They were told they were talented and they kind of ran with that. And yet many of them, and they continue doing that. Yet many of them have done some healing through their work and their art, but many of them have not because it, it's more than just, no, no one painting is going to resolve the, uh, uh, the abandonment they may have felt from their mother who worked nights or what have you, or their father who was a drunk or, you know, they didn't even ever knew. So, you know, I think what's key for so many artists moving forward is to continue to do the work on themselves and maybe, you know, seek that, that help of others and seek modalities that will allow them to, you know, uh, identify their past trauma and then work through them. Beautifully said. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I have discovered in 20 plus years of coaching people that what really causes procrastination is trauma and what causes low self-worth typically is trauma. Yeah. And if the person can get into their body, do embodiment work, breath work, movement work, it facilitates the healing much faster than talking. Although talking is important. Yeah. It's not enough. I agree. And I think one of the, I think another fear that I've, I've seen, especially with comedians, is that if I address 
and heal my trauma, I will lessen my art because I've been using my art to heal or to address that. And I believe that's a lie. Mm. I believe that's a lie. People tell yourself, I had one therapist tell me, if you do the work, you get to take the gifts with you. Like you won't lose the gifts. Uh, I will say that you won't be painting the same paintings or telling the same jokes. Oftentimes, if you're doing the are writing the same stories, if you do the healing and it'll be different and that's scary. You know, the question is, will I, you know, I was known for this. Will I be accepted for this other thing in the future? Um, that is scary because, you know, a lot of people say if it's not broken, don't fix it. And I mean that in terms of art, and I don't mean that necessarily in or, or anything for that matter. And I think the, uh, I, I would challenge artists to, to do the healing work and to, um, and trust that the art will be even richer on the other side of that. I agree. I wonder sometimes if that whole story about I'm going to lose my edge if I heal is really a, a rationalization to not heal because as you and I both know, going through the process of addressing one's trauma, at least initially, can be very uncomfortable yeah. and confrontive. Correct. I also, it just came to my mind, I also think that there are stories out there that I believe are true, that were comedians we're doing stand-up material and then they you know went to a psychiatrist and then were prescribed medications oh oh and yeah they would say when i'm on the pills i am not as funny and i'm wondering and that's probably true oh probably because there's a lot of recetatives yeah they slow you right down yes and that's probably true and then maybe other people are saying oh, I shouldn't go to therapy then <laughs> because maybe I'll be less funny, but really it's not the healing. It is the, the effects of the uh, pharmaceuticals that may be associated with certain psychiatrists or what have you. So yeah, yeah I'm sure that's part of it. I'm sure that's absolutely part of it. I, I, I just find in general, the, the really deep healing is something that the majority of people I encounter resist until they realize that the resistance is going to cause them even more suffering. Yes. And they have something that they want that's greater. Uh, they have a goal, maybe, that is something that's beyond what they've previously achieved. And they can see that until they move these boulders out of the way, it's not going to happen. Yeah. The other, the other issue that I see that maybe people will face is the healing work takes two things, time and money. <laughs> and if, if there is an artist on the rise, time and money is incredibly valuable. They're like, oh, if healing's gonna take me an hour a day of work, that's an hour a day I could be writing or an hour a day I could be painting or rehearsing or what have you. And if the, you know, the one thing that we know in our society is that really good work is expensive. And oftentimes the, the, the best people who do the, are healers are not covered by insurance. <laughs> so that ends up being a major expense. Mm -hmm. And they say, I could spend this money on a therapist or a healer, or I could save that money, or I could spend that money on classes or um, technical equipment that mm -hmm. I could be recording okay. podcasts. Not new microphone. Show. Yeah, or the, the you know, I, that's a cost of a camera that could yeah. up up the quality of my you know Instagram posts or my web videos or what have you. So it it is it is a I understand how challenging it is and how daunting it is, especially for people on the rise. Um, and then also you know there 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 has long been a sense of of shame associated with getting help and treating trauma, like if I do the work, I'm going to find things that are going to scare the hell out of me that are going to redefine who I am, that I may have to say publicly, I'm broken. I have a problem, you know, and scare other people away, either in personal or business relationships. I, I get how scary it is, but I, I going through the process myself, I just can tell everybody it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, they certainly are. So, so what has been to date, the most exciting project you've worked on? And, and can you walk us through briefly the, the process of that? The most exciting project I've worked on by probably a country mile is the TV show, Key and Peele. Mm -hmm. It's an idea, you know, I, I, at the time I was representing Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele, 
and they both were on Mad TV together, and they they had left. And um, Keegan um, was doing a show called Gary Unmarried with Jay Moore, and Jordan had just done a pilot for Fox that didn't go. And so, in the course of one day, they were the both of their shows. Jordan's show didn't get picked up. Keegan's show got canceled. And I said, I called him like, why don't we do a show together? You know, the, the Chappelle show on Comedy Central had been off the air for two years. And I knew, I knew for uh, directly from Comedy Central that they were looking for something to replace it. And I said, why don't we do a sketch show together? It's just you. It'll be like all those single camera sketches that you did on Mad TV. We'll do it without a laugh track. And we, let's put a pitch together. It was my idea. I wrote a treatment. Nothing that was in the treatment ever ended up in the show. And then Keegan and Jordan started writing sketches together. And there's a famous sketch that they wrote called I Said Bitch. And it's really, really funny. I love that one. I was just thinking. It's so funny. They came up with that idea and they pitched it in the room, both Fox and Comedy Central. And the buyers were literally crying. We got offers from both places. We chose Comedy Central. And then we started doing the pilot and, you know, we hired the director who's a client of mine, the showrunners who were clients of, of my colleague. And it was just a loving family, virtually problem free for five seasons of two of the most talented people I've ever known working together, collaborating, you know, unbelievably versatile actors who can do almost every accent. They play men, they can play women, they can play Hispanic, they can play Middle Eastern and Indian and, you know, various, uh, you know, dialects of the African-American culture. It was just a real joy to be a part of. And it was great because, you know, I'd hang out with the guys in the morning, they'd be dressed as women and have a business conversation. In the afternoon, they'd be gangsters. You know, it was just so much fun. And everybody on the crew, because the top of the show, both Jordan and Keegan are just such lovely, wildly creative human beings that set the tone of the entire production organization and everyone got along and it was trouble free. And it was beautiful. And in a way, it spoiled me for some of my subsequent productions because I was, I just thought you go to work and there, there's no problems. Everyone's having a good time. That wasn't the case on all of my subsequent productions. So my first couple, I was ill-equipped. I was not a great producer because I was definitely like a fan of the Bulls when they were winning all those championships as opposed to like a fan of the Bulls in any other season. You know, it was, it was, it was challenging. So anything uh, exciting upcoming that you can talk about? I mean, so many so many cool things I, you know I have, I have a lot of great clients with a lot of really cool upcoming projects in terms of like something that is that I've, I've shot that's in the can that's awaiting release i don't have anything of that nature but i have a lot of really cool things in development and i'm just excited that you know i've been doing i've been a talent manager 21 and a half years and there was a period about five years ago that i'm thinking maybe maybe this is the end, you know, maybe it's time for a new chapter, but I think, you know, through all the work I've done personally, I'm, I'm more excited about my career and helping artists. And I feel more qualified to help them um, at the mid and highest level than I've ever been in the past. So I'm just excited for, you know, a lot of the work that, you know, my clients have coming up and that's really all I can say about that. It's great. Now you were recently in Brooklyn. Can you talk about why you were there and yeah i was in brooklyn um i'm an executive producer on a tv show called the last og um which is a tbs show we're in our fourth season it stars tracy morgan we had previously starred tiffany haddish who was a client of mine for many years um during her meteoric rise and then jordan peele's an executive producer on it and it's a really fun show Uh, you know the, the premise of the show is Tracy Morgan plays a character who, you know, sold crack in the 80s or 90s and then spent 15 years in prison for that. And then he comes out and the girlfriend that he was with prior to going to prison um, is married to a white guy who's played by Tiffany Haddish. And um, they have, he has two kids that are his. And so it's this, you know, kind of re-entry into society. It's a, it's a show about, about reinvention, about redemption, and it's, you know, fascinating. And, you know, also a show about how, you know, our country is 
it has the chips stacked against you know people coming out of prison, particularly African Americans, many of whom were sent there harshly. Mm -hmm. So as we come into the home stretch here, every guest I ask them if they have something they'd like to look at in their human design. Yes. And you asked about your environment for success, and if you're not in that environment, what you can do to protect yourself. So I'm going to bring up your chart. Great. And uh, we'll have a look here. Okay, this is you, 124, 72? That's right. Okay, great. So what's really wonderful in human design is there's actually a category in the, it's called the variable known as environment. And your environment happens to be caves. And uh, I wanna explain what caves is because it is a very common environment for people in the entertainment industry people with caves are often drawn to the entertainment industry because the idea of the cave is a safe enclosed space, like a soundstage, like a theater, like even a nightclub or a comedy club. Often, some of the, often there's, those things are in the basement because they're dark, the underground theater, right? And there was a lot of underground theater at, at one time. Uh, even my grandfather had a, his basement in his building was a 99 seat movie theater way back way back, which I think is super cool. He was probably caves. It's this desire to have the, the interior space be very nurturing. And so typically also people with caves environment really like a beautiful home. The aesthetics are super important. Uh, do you find that's true for you? That's correct, yes. And it's ideal if the room, any room has one, the same door in as the same door out. You know, if, if a little child is caves, and they're scared at night because the closet doors open. If, if the parents install like a, a curtain or a photo or something in front of that door, often the child will calm right down. They just need to know that they're safe. They're safe. So there's a huge desire for safety with this environment, for feeling nurtured by your space and even feeling enclosed. Uh, mm -hmm. Your car is a, is a cave of sorts. It's a mobile cave. And so Usually people with this environment, it, depending on their budget, want to have a vehicle that is akin to a traveling office that allows them to make phone calls or yeah. what have you, or even be driven around in a limousine so they can work in the back. But that, that's your correct environment. So where you're not protected is if you get into other environments for too long of a stretch without having the cave to go back to. Uh, also, there's usually a need for solitude, a lot of solitude with the cave. I mean, there's the, the, the phrase man cave, although women have caves too. But, but what I find with this environment, whether the person lives alone or with, lives with their family, um, there's a need to have their own space. They've got to have their own space within that environment, an, you know, an office or a meditation room, an art studio, something that they can retreat to and, and tell everyone, do not disturb. It's really vital. Also home offices are, are common with caves environments. So for you, it's just anytime you're out of spaces that are familiar to you that feel secure, mm -hmm. it's just important that that doesn't go on too long and you get back to a space that does feel enclosing and secure yeah. because that's what actually protects your energy. The environment is what protects our energy. Okay. Um, there's 12 different environments. Uh, I think you are, let's look here, caves. Yeah, it's to the left. It's uh, caves active. These arrows here. When it's this, this whole system is based on a binary of of masculine, feminine, yin yang, that kind of thing. And so, a left energy essentially in human design. Left is active. It's focused. It's masculine. It's yang. So, um, uh, an active cave environment would be a movie theater, a soundstage, mm -hmm. uh, um, a writer's room. Uh, an underground comedy club. So you're definitely in the right environment. And so when you're in those environments a lot, it, it, it actually activates your energy. And say if you were up isolated in a yurt on the mountaintop without, without a lot of social interaction, that wouldn't be good for you. Yeah. Not long term. It would be unhealthy. Be okay for a weekend, but you wouldn't want to move someplace remote because this is about being in the in the heat of the action in yeah. in dark you know closed spaces yeah. even a nightclub you know that's like an active cave like someone who is a nightclub owner 
who has caves. It's perfect. That's, they're in their right space. Mm -hmm. They might even have a back office in there where they have a little bed they can go sleep in or whatever. They don't want to leave the cave. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find that a lot. Now, in terms of overall success for you, I'm going to go down to your your body graph here, which is really the heart of the human design system. It's the one thing that sets it apart from all the other systems is this graph. It's essentially a circuit board. So whatever's colored in is Joel. And what's not colored in is where the conditioning comes in. It's, it's also whatever's in white is what attracts the other person. Now, what I find very interesting is you have this one eight channel here, right in the center that connects this G center to your throat. And the one eight channel is the artist talent manager. It's both. Mm -hmm. Gate eight is called the talent manager. So oh, really? yeah, it's actually, it's its nickname, yes. Uh, and one is creative self-expression. And I find it interesting that the very first codon of DNA or gate is one, uh, is creative expression. That's what I'm trying to say. Creative expression is number one. That, that is the first piece of a healthy self and self-love is to express. And since you have the whole channel, your, your um, creative ideas are able to be expressed through the eight and gate eight is technically called contribution. It's nicknamed the talent manager, yeah. but the contribution is finding creative projects and sharing them with society. That's the highest frequency of it, mm -hmm. right? That's the highest, I mean, a lot of times it's like, let's make money, which is fine. But the higher calling of this is to have art that moves and influences and impacts society in positive ways, yeah. which it sounds like you're very much about. Yeah, I also get like when we get into the deal making on a lot of my client stuff, I lose energy. And yet I'm fortunate enough because there's usually an agent and an attorney involved who love talking about the money. Yeah, know? yeah. well, you're not a deal maker. This yeah, isn't I'm the deal, a deal maker, maker chart. And so it's great that you have deal makers because you're more the, the star creator type yeah. in your own energy. You're able to do both. And if I were to encourage you in any way, I would, I would, I would be saying, what about your show? You know, or like even a show that you have a part in it because yeah. you're very, very charismatic and you're very intuitive. Um, you have excellent, excellent instincts and uh, you have a wide emotional a really wide emotional range, but uh, this 3420 is the charisma channel. Mm. And uh, I find this consistently in performers, this charisma channel. Mm. Uh, it's also the manifesting generator channel of, it's the only manifesting generator, pure manifesting generator channel, which means that this energy from the 34, which is called power, and it's not, it's not verbal. It's, a, it's like a, 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 a pressure and it goes right up to the throat. So it's this feeling where, where words must be turned into deeds. Like, I'm not just gonna talk for the sake of talking. If I talk, I'm gonna make it happen. And so typically people with this channel do what they say they're gonna do. They, you almost can't help it. Yeah. Because you're driven to create. You're driven to get that creativity out. And you have it in two ways. You have the 3420, yeah. which wants to verbally express that creative urge and then the one eight that wants to take the, the art and bring it out to society bring it out to the masses uh, and and uh in terms of your environment for success creatively it's about relationships and emotions so i find that so interesting this this design mars i call desk work because the planet of mars is the energy for doing and it's also the most young part of us that's wanting expression. So when I teach classes about people's business structure, I look at this design Mars first and gate 30 is over here off the solar plexus, which is about, gate 30 is called desire. And your work is about desire. And a line two energy is about messaging, marketing, partnership, intimacy being mesmerizing. So the, the essence of your work, your work, and the deeper you go into this, I think the more exciting it's gonna be for you is what creates desire between people? And what do people do with their desire? Yeah. 
right? Like, what do we do? Because desire is always coming and going. You can't just live off desire. You'll make yourself insane. And some people try to until it burns them out. But this is, this is really getting to desire as a way to have new experiences for the sake of the experience. And so when you talk about surrender, that is just perfect for this design because surrender says, I'm going into this experience because I want to, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who I'm going to meet. I don't know what I'm going to feel, but I want to feel something new. And one of the things in our DNA is the desire to feel new feelings, to have new emotional experiences, to be able to say, God, I've never felt this before. I've never um, you know, felt so alive, felt so connected, felt so aware, whatever it might be. And of course, the more a person's growing, the more every relationship will build on itself. So the essence, the theme for you of your creative work is desire plus partnership and all the things that go with that. And the way you actually create it is through your design Jupiter, which is a uh, gate 9.3. And we're not going to worry about this other number here, but it's 9.3. Um, and gate nine down here off the sacral is about focus and details. So when you need to get something done, watch out. I mean, you have the busyness channel, the 3420 that has all that charisma. And then nine is details, details, details. And line three is about having a business that's a family team. So you do best if your team is three to 15 people and not much more. Even on, even on a set, it's ideal if it's under 16 people. It's just the right number for you. It's called the unit, and it has a family dynamic to it. You and I have talked about this before, yeah. this family energy that you have. Yeah. Um, the other piece to this is what you bring is the strategic focus. That's what I would call 9.3. It's strategic focus to something as ephemeral as desire. And so your own setup is very balanced between masculine and feminine. And I don't know if people have mentioned that to you, your therapists or coaches or other yeah. clients, but that you're very level headed. And it's because your mind can actually tame your emotions and you're able to release them in a sense when the time is right, which is a skill. It's a real skill to be able to be, have emotional mastery. And, and not deny our feelings, but also not be breaking down at every writer circle, right? Um, you know, breaking down inappropriately during the deal. But if you have to have a breakdown, you're able to, but maybe you do it in your car, you know, when you're by yourself. Um, you know, you have, a, you have mastery of your emotions. So I just would encourage you um, more on this relationship theme. I also think, I know it's really hot now because I'm seeing all these embodiment coaches start to proliferate the internet. I have clients who do embodiment. I'm taking embodiment class with a guy teacher and it's a whole group of women and learning more and more about polarity and you know the work of David Data and all that stuff, which I've been studying for probably 20 years, but I just can't get enough of it. So I know that just from what I'm seeing from my online business world, that people are wanting a different kind of intimacy. And so it would be great for you to bring out more humor and levity and vulnerability in terms of relationships. Because even in movies, for the most part, I, I feel like the intimacy isn't there in stories. I mean, I get bored. I'm like, come on, like, take us deeper. Let's go deeper. And so it, I, I will finish with this thought that, that what is being asked for is depth and you have the depth. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there only because I have another call. I have to go to shortly. Otherwise I talk to you all day. Any final words of wisdom for our, well, first of all, before I ask you that, any ahas from what I just shared? I mean, w w the aha that, you know, really came for me is, you know, two things. One is that so much of what you're saying is, exactly what I'm exercising in the novel I'm writing, which is a romantic comedy where it's a bunch of people, many people who are meeting for the very first time. It's all a group of people who are starting new, real, new romantic relationships. And it very much aligns with that. And it's been very easy and fun 
for me to write and it's been just ex exciting and I'm, I, I'm very and it's all it's it's humor it's very funny but at the same time it's it's still very honest and and real and then the second thing is you know so much of what i've been working on in, in my in my personal work is um and i feel that there is this balance i feel in my person i feel there's a balance of the masculine and feminine in me but i've spent i'm 49 years old i think i've spent most of those 49 years um not trusting the feminine side and likely has you know to do with my experience with the feminine in my youth. And I think as I'm doing the work of trusting the feminine, unblocking that channel, I do feel that, you know, I think some of my best work and my greatest gifts will be shared in the coming years. So thank you for um, providing further um, motivation for that. I have no doubt about it. So any final words of wisdom for our audience? Uh, I, just, I really wanted to thank you because, you know, uh, several years ago, you gave me um, a reading and explained it and you also coupled it with your hand analysis. And it's something that I will listen to at least annually. And every time I listen to it, uh, I, I gained new insights uh, from it and never has any even one bit of it felt to be to have rung untrue. So anybody out there who's listening who has not you know, gotten their charts read on human design or not had a, a proper hand analysis, I strongly encourage them to do it and record it and access it and reference it on a regular basis. I do think you'll be rewarded the way I have. And I thank you for listening. Oh, thanks, Joel. We'd love to have you back sometime. Love to be back. It's great to have you. All right, everyone. Bye for now. This has been another episode of Align to Your Design and we'll see you real soon. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Align to Your Design. If you did, please grab my free report, Business by Design, at yourpurpose.com and then join our Facebook group, Align to Your Design. See you next time.